Welcome to everyone. Today we are going to have a glimpse into Saint Jean Archer from Macbeth by William Shakespeare. But why did I decide to talk specifically about this scene? I mean, it is arguably one, well, if not the most important, I would say one of the most crucial moments of all the play. But before that, Macbeth is probably, I would say, one of the shortest tragedies that Shakespeare had ever written and uh, had ever, ever performed. But remember, Macbeth was written in 1606 when there was King James I and uh, Queen Elizabeth I had uh, recently died. She died in 1603. And the following king, King James VI, at first and then it was proclamated as King James the first of England who was a fanatic of Shakespeare plays I mean even invited him at his court to to perform his plays comedies or even tragedies in this case but um, the peculiarity of King James the first was the fact that I mean he didn't love so much long plays I mean he preferred short uh, tragedies as it is for Macbeth. Here you are the reason why Macbeth is probably one of the shortest plays that, uh, that Shakespeare wrote in his life. Uh, there is an implicit influence of King James I on the play that Shakespeare wrote in 1606 and there's even an implicit reference to the king. Well first of all King James I is probably one of the worst considered kings of all time I mean, it was <clears throat> it was known to unify two realms into one. Indeed, uh, James was at first the king of Scotland, and then when he was proclamated as king of England, he unified both Scotland and England under a unique crown. And this reference is um, is mentioned in in the first scene of the first act of Macbeth where Shakespeare says and yet the eighth appears who bursts a glass which shows me many more and some I see that shall four balls and tribal captors carry this is emblematic I mean this part where Shakespeare implicitly says that King James the sixth of Scotland unified these two rival countries into an only nation but going back to Sin Chu Ak Chu, I mean, this scene that we're going to analyze today, this is the moment when Macbeth uh, kills King Duncan with two daggers. But why does he kill King Duncan? Uh, making a short excursus to Macbeth, uh, in the opening scene, Macbeth was told a prophecy by the so called Three Viervor sisters as Shakespeare says, which are simply three witches which uh, make this prophecy, you know, where Macbeth was going to be the following king of Scotland. But when he was first told the prophecy, he was doubtful. I mean, he didn't believe them and he um, was even diffident. He, he tried to um, to take distance from these witches and um, in addition to this, he even calls them imperfect speakers. This is emblematic of the attitude that Macbeth has towards these Viewer sisters at first. But there's even, for instance, another scene, scene 3, act 1, where Macbeth talks to Banku, who was a friend of him, and he says, but why do you dress me in boiled robes? But then we'll see in the fifth scene of the first act, for example, where Macbeth addresses a letter to Lady Macbeth in order to inform her about what had previously happened. And he says, they met me in a day of success and have learned by the perfect report. They have more in them than mortal knowledge. Be careful. In this scene, in the fifth scene of the first act, he says, and I have learned by the perfect report. When he firstly says in the third scene of the same act, 
imperfect speakers. And here you see the changement of the character. I mean, a character who was a loyal person, a loyal knight to the king. But then the more the play goes on, the more he wants to, to animate this fire that he has inside, but mostly pushed by his wife, Lady Macbeth, who has, uh, let's say, a remarkable impact on this final decision. I mean, he was at first diffident from these witches, and then Lady Macbeth convinces her husband to, to kill King Duncan, even in order to, to succeed the throne of or the reign of Scotland. But here, in this specific scene, in scene two, act two, we see this feeling, this sentiment that he has, I mean, this sense of regret. Macbeth feels guilty of killing King Duncan. This scene opens with Macbeth, who, who keeps in his hands two daggers, the daggers that he used to kill King Duncan. At the beginning, there's Lady Macbeth, who is on her own, I mean, she talks on her own. We might consider this part as a sort of monologue, you know. And in the meanwhile, there's Macbeth, who's committing the crime. But then, when they meet each other, the first thing that Macbeth says is, I've done the deed. And this is emblematic, I mean, this sentence is emblematic. I've done the deed. You can already feel this dental consonants, you know, this alliteration of D, or these D sounds, I've done the deed, which is already crucial, you know. It is interesting to underline the use of did. It doesn't say I, I made the action or other expressions. I mean, it says I've done the deed. And this word did reminds us already of uh, what is going to happen later on. It is a sort of anticipation of the crime that he committed. And then he says, didst thou not hear a noise? And Lady Macbeth says, I heard the howl scream and the crickets cry. In the folklore, according to, to the legend, you know, to, to the ancient beliefs, the owl, the owl scream reminds of uh, a bad home and it was thought to be something negative. Above all, if it was heard during the night, as it is in this case. And the same thing is for the cricket's cry. They are both metaphors of death, which uh, show sounds, which foreshadow the death, the imminent death of the king. And then she continues, she says, Do you know you speak? When? Now, as I descended, I. Well, if you see carefully this part, the more we read, the more the rhythm gets faster. These short sentences build um, a palpable tension the climax gets higher. I mean, these sentences, these answers are concise, are short, and they are made on purpose. I mean, this rhythm builds a sort of tension in the atmosphere and in this passage, which finishes off with A. Indeed, if you read it, when, now, as I descended, I, there's this dialogue, this peculiar dialogue. And then Macbeth says, Hark, listen, who lies in the second chamber, Donadon. This is a sorry sight. Here, there's the acknowledgement of the crime that Macbeth committed himself. He starts regretting killing King Duncan in order to succeed his throne and in order to be the following King of Scotland. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. Here we have Macbeth who regrets, you know, who is subject to this feeling of regret. But on the hardy hand, we have Lady Macbeth who tries to reassure her husband, who tries to convince him that he didn't make a crime, but he simply listened to his impulse, to his will to become the new king. He listened to this fire that he had inside, 
but my bed here from now onwards seems to lose connection with with his wife if we look sedulously to this part lady Macbeth says something and Macbeth says something else Macbeth seems to be victim of, of the crime he, he makes several implicit monologues I mean he talks on his own and in the meanwhile there's lady Macbeth who tries to, to talk to him but Macbeth is completely desperate of what he has done but this acknowledgement is even proved by the quotation that he says at a certain point of the same I am afraid to think what I've done look on it again I dare not this is emblematic this is crucial and then he continues he continues expressing his um, his feelings he says listen in their fear I couldn't say amen when they did say God bless us. As you might know, the word Amen is a sort of customary for prayers, a way of concluding a prayer. But he couldn't say this word. But nonetheless, Lady Macbeth says, considering no so deeply, do not give them much credit to this. But nevertheless, Macbeth continues, he says, but wherefore could I pronounce Amen? A most need of blessing and hemin stuck in my throat. And then Lady Macbeth in her turn says, After these ways, so it will make us mad. We are going to get mad if we continue thinking on this. And this is already a sort of anticipation of what is going to happen later on. Lady Macbeth will be committing suicide whilst Macbeth will be killed by the son of the King of Scotland, Macduff. The protagonist insists on this guilt that he feels and he even says, Methought I heard a voice cry, Sleep no more, Macbeth does mortal sleep, the innocent sleep. This is probably one of the most known and famous quotations of this play of Macbeth. Sleep no more, Macbeth can no longer sleep because of the crime that he made. He now has this relentless torment side that he cannot get over from. But more implicitly, he can no longer sleep and he kills his sleep due to the fact that he prevented himself from sleeping, from rest, to kill King Duncan, who was sleeping. He preferred not to sleep himself in order to kill King Duncan who was sleeping in this moment, at, at that moment. And here are the reason why he says, murder of sleep. Not only did he kill the sleep of King Duncan, which became the eternal sleep, I mean, he's now dead, but even killed the other's sleep. But in addition to this, even killed his own sleep. Macbeth is now becoming his own victim of the deed that he made. The tragedy is no longer the tragedy of King Duncan, but it is now the tragedy of Macbeth. But even this parallelism, I mean, sleep and death. I mean, if we simply think of the sleep and the death, the sleep is basically the final part of the day, and death is the final part of our life. But this parallelism is even introduced by Lady Macbeth later on, where she says the sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Indeed, Lady Macbeth tries to say that there's nothing to be frightened about due to the fact that a sleeping person doesn't know there is a sleep. And the same thing is for a dead man. A corpse doesn't know that he is dead. They are standing there. I mean, they are passive. They cannot have a connection with us and there's nothing to be frightened about. They are like pictures, they are standing there, they are not moving and they cannot affect you. And then Lady Macbeth continues saying that just children can be scared of these pictures, of these scary pictures. Well, but even more banally, this idea of picture is interesting. I mean, we even see this image with the picture of Doran Gray by making an example. Well, in, the, in that case, the narrator says, but there was just one piece of evidence left against him. 
the picture itself, that was evidence. And whereas in the picture of Dorian Gray, the picture represents a fact, uh, an evidence here in a bath, it is something passive, which cannot have a, an impact on you. This is what Lady Macbeth is trying to say to her husband. My hands are of your color, but a shame to wear a heart so white. Even this, this quotation, I mean, we might say that Lady Macbeth is starting repenting. She's starting uh, regretting in her turn. Not only does Macbeth feel guilty, but even Ma Lady Macbeth now, I mean, she's the prototype of a strong woman, which is a paradox. I mean, at the time, we all knew that the role should have been inverted. I mean, the man is the main authority, whilst women were weaker compared to the men. Whilst here, in this play, it is Lady Macbeth who seems to be in a superior position compared to Macbeth himself. But then these few, let's say, weak feelings that Lady Macbeth has, are mostly overhemmed by her strong attitude, strong personality. She says, a little water clears us of this deed, you know, this idea of cleaning the hands, which reminds us of Pontio Pilato, as you might know. How easy is it then? Your constancy have left you an attendant. But then there's the final part of this scene, where Mabeth says, to know my date, twer best not know myself. If I had known what I had done, I would have preferred not to be myself. I would have preferred be another person in this circumstance. Wake Duncan with thy no king. And here there's probably one of the most powerful sentences of all the tragedy. But definitely this scene, I would, thou coldst, I wish you could, but you can no longer wake him up from the eternal sleep because of me. And now, this conclusion of the second scene, of the second act, is the start of the new reign, the coronation of the new king, but more implicitly, it is the start, the beginning of the decay of Macbeth, who is now aware of what is done. Well, this was in overall, let's say, a detailed view of Sinchu Hachu from Macbeth. And uh, well, as you might have understood, this is a crucial part of the tragedy. I mean, it is the acknowledgement of the protagonist of the crime that he committed. At first, he killed King Duncan. He was following this fire, this wish, to be the new king, to have power, to have fame. But once he committed the crime, he acknowledged that he would have never been the same, that he would have been condemned to this eternal torment, to this eternal disturb that he has. Well, see you soon.